So I launched it at, uh, I think, uh, midnight and in the morning when I woke up, mm-hmm. I was going to play volleyball and like uh, my phone keep kept ringing because I have this um, push notifications mm-hmm. to my Telegram chat bot from Stripe. So whenever there's a payment, I get notified and like, okay, okay, okay. I keep getting these notifications that somebody paid 199199199. It's pretty much I one think, day, yeah. $10,000. Well, two, two days, I think. Two yeah. days. Like, it's well, a 24 hour cycle, more or less. Is that yeah. the best two day period you've ever done in terms of <laughs> revenue? <laughs> yes, so I, I think the most successful <laughs> launch. Alrighty, welcome to Indie Worldwide. I'm your host, Anthony. We have with us today, Hari Krishna, better known by his moniker on Twitter, hacker from Simple Ops, and also from VisaList today with us. How are you doing, Harry? Uh, I'm doing great. Thanks, Anthony, for having me. Um, so let's jump yeah. right into it. You've got a lot of projects under your belt. You've got Simple Ops, VisaList. Um, I've also seen on your Twitter, you've got other projects going like Acrypto and Explore. You've got a lot going on. I think you're probably best known for Visa List, if not Simple Ops. Is there um, yeah. one of those that you feel like currently more passionate about? What is, where's most of your attention going out of all the projects that you have? Uh, right now, it's mostly Simple Ops uh, because I've started recently. It's been just three months. Uh, I've uh, mm-hmm. crossed 10K revenue. So, so I'm trying to grow this. And this is my mm-hmm. first B2B uh, uh, project that I've uh, started. Also, it uh, I think this is something which is not dependent on the current situation, mm. which is COVID. So Visa List was, I mean, it it was heavily dependent on travel, and mm-hmm. it was also heavily impacted by COVID because uh, you know travel was restricted. So, uh, but I actually wanted to take a break back in January when this was not mm-hmm. massive. Uh, because I've been working on Visa List for two years, so uh, I thought I should, uh, you know, take a break from that, uh, mm-hmm. do something else, and then come back to that. So that was my plan. Can this you explain plan. briefly what Visa List is and how it works for anybody who might not know? Sure. Uh, so, okay, I, it started with a simple idea. Um, so anybody who wants to travel, mm-hmm. uh, I mean. If you are from, uh, you know, uh, G7 countries like uh, uh, the top countries, right? US, UK, um, Australia, Canada. So uh, your passports are generally very powerful. That means you could easily travel to a lot of countries, 100 plus countries without any visa. You just go to the airport, take a ticket and just, you know, sit on the mm-hmm. plane and go there. Uh, but the rest of the world, which is, you know, uh, obviously the biggest uh, chunk of it uh, uh, don't have powerful passports and they need to get a visa. Um, And every country has different websites and uh, the interpretation of the visa requirements that you need to do and it's a laborious process. Um, So I personally faced this problem when I was, uh, uh, I mean, I started traveling uh, back three years back. So I personally faced a lot of problems. So I thought, uh, you know, I should make it easy for myself. Mm. And in the process, I realized like uh, this problem exists for a lot of people. And once I launched, it went viral. So basically, Visa List helps you cut down all the research uh, for the requirements to get a visa. Uh, basically, it's uh, almost, uh, you know, updated in real, not in real time, but very frequently unlike any other resource that is available. And it is for any country to any country in the world, almost 240 plus countries. I want to get back to the virality in early visa list, but for as far as like recent times, how much of a hit has that product taken due to COVID and like travel stopping? Hmm. So actually, um, it turned out that February was my uh, biggest month in terms of revenue. Oh wow! Before uh, COVID actually hit it hard. Mm. So, and once it hit, uh, uh, the revenue dropped uh, by almost seventy percent. Uh, that was back in April. 
but I, most of it has recovered. I would say at least 50% of it has recovered, mm-hmm. but still a long way to go. Um, but yeah, yeah, uh, it was, yeah, that was more or less, uh, yeah. So did it answer the question? What did you do at the beginning? Were there steps you took to make it go viral or did it just mm, happen? Uh, I think it happened. Uh, I didn't, I, I mean, I never thought it would be, it would go viral. Like I was hoping that it would have a decent run, you know, people would, you know, find it useful and that's it. Mm-hmm. But I, uh, I think uh, uh, it was from the product hunt launch that it went mm-hmm. viral. Uh, Ryan actually took a screenshot of uh, one of the maps, which um, yeah, it's very good to, I think it's basically that take uh, my take on visa requirements, mm-hmm. make it easily accessible to everyone. Uh, I think that was uh, one of the novelty factors, I think, which made it viral, but I don't know. Yeah, you never know why things go well. Yeah, I never That's thought true. of it. So yeah. after the product hunt launch, it just kind of took off from there. That's when media picked it up. Yes, organically, a lot of, uh, you know, news agencies picked it up. And it, and I think uh, in a span of a week, mm-hmm. I got somewhere around 150K users, like in a very wow. short span. And I didn't have any monetization uh, uh, model in, in, in the website, mm-hmm. uh, which, you know, on hindsight, I, like, I think it was bad. I could have easily monetized that big, huge amount of traffic. Uh, mm-hmm. But um, that was, you know, uh, only the beginning. Uh, but after a month, uh, the reality hit hard, you know, mm-hmm. uh, the traffic bent uh, nose diving from 150 K to 20 K users and like in a month. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, that, (laughs) you know, a lot of people think uh, launches are are, uh, the way to go. And, you know, if, if it goes, uh, you know, really well, everything is a cakewalk. Uh, It's really not. That's honestly doesn't sound too terrible of a a nose drive. If you're still sustaining 20 K after the initial launch. Like you're going to expect that traffic to be pretty spiky, but if you still have 20,000 retained, then you definitely have something serious still, a, a business. Yeah, but it's the trajectory. Mm. Like the rate of fall, if, you know, from 50K you f- f- fell to 20K in mm-hmm. one month, the next month, obviously, the same percentage would continue. So that yeah. that was the biggest concern, and it actually did uh, for a while. There's no way that's not going to gonna hurt. Um, so after, yeah, of course, nose- when you're starting with zero, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, zero to 150 feels amazing, but 150 to 20 has to feel similarly bad. After you saw the traffic go down, what did you, what did you do? So, um, actually, uh, I released visa list after working on it for on and off for almost six months. Mm. So, so I completed uh, the MVP mm. in a month and I was just collecting data. Mm. If you uh, know, I mean, if you've used VisaList, right, you would know it's a, a huge amount of data points, which is not readily available. Yeah. Uh, there is no API. Uh, uh, so I took a page from Peter Levels and actually uh, started curating the data myself because mm-hmm. ultimately data is the most powerful thing uh, you could have. Uh, and then you could play with that, uh, you know, you can do a lot of things with data if you have data. And there is no single source which has this amount of data anywhere. So it took me a, a lot of while and I was on vacation for two, three months and it was on and off. Uh, but uh, from the start, I had this goal in mind that SEO is the only way uh, visa list is going to actually uh, make uh, some revenue uh, and i never lost the sight of it so even after it went viral i was you know i was overwhelmed but uh, i always had this uh, uh, you know uh, i knew that seo is going to make it or break it mm-hmm. so i kept experimenting because i was new i mean 
uh, before VisaList, I've never built a website. I've, I was basically an Android uh, 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 engineer. Uh, I've built uh, iOS apps before that. Mm -hmm. But I've never built a full-fledged website, and this was my first time. Um, and SEO, I knew what it was like from the outside, but uh, it never went deep. And this was the time where I was still experimenting, still hoping that you know something will happen. You know, uh, maybe uh, in this bla big black box, I'll crack a few things here and there, and eventually it did. How much is SEO responsible for visualist traffic now? Um, um, it used to be 95%, I think now it's somewhere around 80, 80%. And that'd be on uh, how many because users? Because volume grew. Sorry? That'd be 95% of, of 20,000? Or is it increased? Uh, that? Oh, uh, right now, uh, it's uh, somewhere around uh, 300K. Monthly? Monthly active users, yeah. And now uh, SEO is actually, responsible for like ninety uh, percent of that. Yeah, yeah, nine, yeah, yeah, uh, eighty-five. The uh, because uh, it's been almost two years, right? People, mm -hmm. you know, when when it it's something um, like I I feel very proud of it. Uh, not because of the revenue or the traffic, but uh, when somebody tells you that you know, I found about VisaList in one of my family's uh, WhatsApp chat group or mm. in my company slack group somebody posted this so i think uh, when when people talk about visa requirements i think people uh, it, it comes to their mind is visa you know visa list comes to their mind and yeah. i think yeah i think i've succeeded at that level where it is actually helping people uh, you know to to uh, you know map out the journey make it easy for them to get the visa and travel yeah that sounds like you're kind of at the center of several sweet spots it's like easy name to remember, very useful service, great design, at least to like a high viral coefficient where people want to recommend it and you, you end up finding it in things like your, your family's WhatsApp group. Um, yeah. Going back to the, to the SEO, uh, what were the things that you learned when you were trying to learn SEO? What are the things that have um, led to, it sounds like 280,000 users a month finding your website through search engines? SEO, um, so uh, there are two aspects of SEO. If you've uh, ever uh, got deep into it, mm -hmm. it's basically trying to optimize the page itself, uh, which is basically uh, uh, in-page uh, SEO optimization, which is basically title, uh, you know, the description, the content, the meta tags, you know, the mm -hmm. uh, all the all the all the shebang there. That's only the foundation of it mm. and it took me a while to nail it down uh, the the real challenge is what you build on top of that foundation which is actually what could make uh, the seo work for you mm -hmm. and i so one of the things that i did was you know because i'm new and you know i uh, I'm actually uh, more frugal. So instead of investing uh, a lot of money on agencies who would do the work for you, and because I'm an indie hacker and I love working on things and the things that I don't know, I, mm. I love learning them. So I started reading about uh, SEO. Um, mm. One of the things that I think has really worked for me is to see how others are doing. I mean, I don't have any competitors exactly uh, in the space that I do, but similar space, travel. Uh, so I looked at them, how are they ranking and what are the things that they have done, uh, uh, you know, different from whatever I have right now. And I picked a uh, few things from here, a few things from there, try to mix and match and experiment it. And this is the biggest, uh, I think, uh, learnings that I have. If I had not done that, I don't mm. think I would have ever reached to the success that I have, the experimentation. And it went on for, I think, four or five months. A lot of people just give up, uh, you know, mm. one month, two months down the line. And for me, it was almost, uh, I think, uh, almost a year from when I actually started uh, writing the first line of code mm -hmm. to, you know, uh, cracking the SEO and, you know, seeing massive growths just organically.
so a lot of people just give up and i think uh, yeah uh, that's also a reason why a lot of uh, people don't find success is because as i said you know before right i always had this in mind when i first started working on visa list that seo is going to make or break and i stuck to that and uh, kept experimenting uh, if you want to go into specific i can tell you a few things that i did there for sure that'd be awesome in terms of experimentation so two things i've noticed uh, generally that is the title if you if mm-hmm. you see a lot of uh, uh, okay where you are trying to actually automate the description like for blog posts um, mm-hmm. you have to write every post is a specific one unique one maybe that there are categories but they are very unique for example interviews they are usually unique um, uh, you know if you are writing about travel uh, you know you are going to a specific country so it's basically uh, very unique uh, uh, but when you are doing it for 200 plus into 200 like almost uh, 40 40 50000 combinations of visa requirements because you know let's say uh, australian visa requirements uh, for us citizens australian visa requirements for indians australian visa requirements for canadians so you know that those are the combinations uh, those are the number of pages that i had i've realized uh, so uh, generally what people think when they are new to it they actually uh, use very generic uh, things that comes to their mind which is basically uh, visa requirements Mm. for australia or something similar where mm-hmm. most of the generic words come to the beginning they start with visa requirements so when i say visa requirements when i talk to you it's visa requirements for australia that's how i say it. Mm-hmm. but what i realized is uh, and and if you see the pattern right Mm-hmm. So all of these will start with visa requirements for Australia uh, for uh, US citizens. So if you put all of them in a in a in a list, visa requirements for Australian visa or Australian yeah, those are the common ones. So when Google you know search crawler looks at it, it finds it almost similar. Like uh, two three words of the title is almost the same. So these are uh, same pages, almost same pages. Uh, so what I realized is that it has to be unique for Google to identify you uh, and rank you higher. So I flipped it. I said, okay, I don't want to do that. I would use the combination of the most important keyword in that title, which is basically you, for US citizens. So I would try to move that to the beginning. It's just an example. So mm-hmm. try to remove all the repetitive keywords uh, and then try to push the unique ones to the starting of the title. Uh, over a period of time, I've learned that. And that actually helps. Yeah, I'm looking at your because site now. I'm seeing like Algeria visa requirements, document checklist, visa. Yeah. Like you're leading yeah. with Algeria so, first and then like requirements, document checklist isn't one that I would think would be as common yeah, either. Yeah, visa requirements, instead of saying visa requirements, it's it's Australian visa requirements or Algeria's visa requirements. So that mm-hmm. is the unique word which I'm trying to move. So does the and order that's when, of the words matter when it comes to SEO and ranking for, for keywords? Yeah, yeah um, so uh, SEO is a black box. So we can only mm-hmm. see from what we try and how it helps us move in the ranking. So from mm-hmm. my understanding, uh, yes, it does. Uh, at least that worked for visa list. And uh, I mean, you know, if it had worked for maybe it got me from 20 to 30 K, mm-hmm. maybe not, but it helped me move from 20 K to 300 K. I mean, at one point of time, you know, before COVID, it was somewhere around 400 K, 450 K uh, monthly active users. So that was the potential of it. And I believe that's important. And it, it, if you think about it, it also makes sense, right? Mm-hmm. When when you see when when Google sees it, uh, the crawler, uh, it's almost generic terms are in the beginning. 
But mm-hmm. when it sees uh, the unique keywords, it recognizes them and adds importance to them. So that was one of the ways uh, uh, that I I act. Uh, I mean, I came to this conclusion of uh, overdoing a lot of experiments uh, over uh, five six when, months. When you ran yeah. an experiment, how long would you give it in order to decide if that experiment was a success or not? We're taking days or like a week or a month. How long does it take for something like that to actually affect your yeah. search rankings? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, here's the tricky thing. So when I say experiment, it's not mm-hmm. really an experiment because you can't have a con- okay. Experiment is where you have a conclusive, a conclusive mm-hmm. answer, conclusive data. But when it comes to SEO, there is nothing like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, all these, uh, when I say experiments, it's just, these are basically hunches and try to map it over a period of uh, uh, three weeks to four weeks. And again, it changes based on at what level is your website crawled or how long it has been in SEO's radar. If, if you're a newbie and you're, you're starting a new website, Google will take a lot of time to actually crawl your pages and uh, start showing them as results. But if you've been there for a lot of time mm-hmm. and uh, you have a good r- ranking, so any changes you make, you will see the results in a week. Mm. But you know, if you're new or relatively new, it will it could take up to two months, you know, or three months also. So when you've been so, around for a while, yeah, or a you can do this trial and error process a lot faster. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's true. That's true. But yeah, in the beginning, it, big. it the cycles are very big. Yeah. Mm. So what were some of the the other like key things that you that you discovered through this like trial and error process that let you yes rank well yeah uh, so uh, the other thing which is uh, maybe not a lot of people don't realize is okay so in visa requirements if you think about it mm-hmm. uh, there are top destinations right and obviously when you search for uh, those top destination visa requirements you would find tons of blogs specifically for them Mm -hmm. so they are uh, the keyword ranking uh, uh, it's very difficult to rank in those keywords correct but my approach was different instead of me taking head on with these top pages which would be 50 or 20 or 30 maybe a thousand what i thought or the strategy was now i don't have only these i have everything which is basically 50,000 combination for 50,000, uh, you know, from two destination combinations mm-hmm. and people would search for these as well. Of course, the volume is that would be 10 X and this would be, let's say the 10,000 people search for it. 10 people would search for these uh, other ones, which are not very common. But if you combine these, uh, let's say, uh, not high volume, uh, searches over a period of time, this could trickle down to those pages which are high ranking you know similar keywords so that i think the strategy worked really well rather than me focusing on few pages which mm-hmm. how uh, you know bloggers do they concentrate they write very good articles for few pages they try to rank it very top and all that i did the inverse of it mm-hmm. i actually created as many pages as possible and slowly started ranking there and seo ranking works in you know, very mysterious ways. The mm. it's called trickle down effect. So you have a page which your is a main domain, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, every page adds a value to your base domain. Okay. Even the base domain doesn't have any value or any content in that page. Any page within that domain adds value. It's called uh, domain authority. And then you know, uh, this is for example, Google.com homepage doesn't have any content, but it would have a highest ranking why because all the pages inside google have very high content so if you could rank in one of the pages within the, your website mm-hmm. that ranking over a period of time will help other pages even if they don't have ranking and because i had all the visa requirements somewhere around 50000 combinations mm-hmm. uh, and not the top ones I started ranking in those edge cases or, you know, with low volumes and over a period of time that helped me increase the ranking of the core ones or ones which have higher volume and still happening. So I, I believe over a period of time, the, 
your highest volume search uh, keywords would uh, actually rank visa list higher uh, actually so there the are some SEO instances folks where it's... would call like long tail search results right it's like there's many many searches that have never been not searched exactly before. but not exactly but yes uh, in a similar way uh, okay because so some of this is you're uh, also going very keywords, go ahead yeah so long tail keywords is something different so instead of having one or two words as as the keyword you would have 10 10 words oh, okay here uh, here what i'm doing is the number of keywords are the same mm -hmm. it's just that the volume is small these are not long tail keywords these are normal keywords only it's just because a lot of people don't search these ones mm -hmm. few people search but for those people it's this is very important for them right if you understand uh, you know somebody who's searching for us visa requirements it's equally important because uh, for him that is most important and because a lot of people have that intent it has huge volume but let's say somebody wants to go to for example tunisia mm -hmm. you know the volume would be low but the person who is searching for him it's very important so ultimately it will rank higher so mm -hmm. if you rank uh, number one in those ultimately google recognizes that your website has certain value for that category which is basically visa requirements mm. and slowly that affects uh, you know uh, that, that impact comes to other pages in your website and i think uh, that worked and yeah over over only period of time mm -hmm. you could see this uh, yeah yeah it didn't you can't see this effect uh, in one or two months so because you're generating all these time. pages programmatically you can cover all this um, search engine surface area that nobody else has the time to go after. It's not necessarily yes. long tail. It's just a broad approach. Nobody else can really compete with you yeah. unless they're, they take the same approach. Very smart. Yeah, they, <laughs> they have to get all the data. And because the data, I ended up, most of the data ended up actually gathering manually. So mm -hmm. it's not just generating those pages. It's also collecting that information. But now that I have collected, a lot of people scrape visa lists, but that's a side Sounds, effect. Um, quite quite similar to what Peter Levels does with Nomad List as well. He's got this broad database. Yeah. You mentioned him as an inspiration yeah. earlier, and then he programmatically yeah, creates yeah. all these pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I he he's uh, one of the biggest reasons why I quit my job and you know started doing becoming an indie maker. Um, what was the process like um, becoming an indie? Indie maker deciding to to jump ship. What were you up to before? Hmm. So um, I was a senior product manager in a healthcare startup in India. Um, I've been working there for almost four and a half years. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been in that company, grown. So it's, it's a startup when I first joined. So from uh, software engineer to engineering manager, then jumped uh, from engineering to product, then product to senior product manager. So I've seen and then wore multiple hats over the period. So mm -hmm. I was very familiar with uh, creating anything from scratch to actually releasing it, all of it. Because being an engineer and having the insights of a product manager, mm -hmm. you kind of become an all-rounder. Um, and I was getting bored, uh, you know, you know, or if you work on the same thing for an extended period, you get bored. It's, uh, natural human behavior yeah so then i read uh, this article from peter levels 12 uh, projects in 12 months and uh, and like i was uh, you know really amazed and at the same time uh, one of my colleagues told me something uh, actually very enlightening so when i mixed both of them i was like yes this is my moment you know so what what was the uh, advice was you know or what i have taken from that is a lot of people you know when you are investing in wealth what the famous you know fa uh, phrase that you know don't put all your eggs in a single basket if you've, mm -hmm. you must have heard of this uh, that's because you know wealth if you put all of them and and if the basket breaks if you have one egg and you know, that'll break and you know or you will lose all of it. But if you have a lot of eggs, so you know one egg breaks, you still have a lot of eggs left. 
so diversifying your wealth is a you know biggest uh, or the you know most common advice in uh, wealth management people mm-hmm. give so what if you apply that to your time and energy because if you think about it people who work in day day, to, day jobs you know 9 to 5 yeah they spend almost all their effort time and once they stop they don't get any rewards like when you retire it's all your savings that you have what if instead of constantly working for 30 40 years for a single or basically a company uh, where you're just putting your effort and time what if you put this effort and time into multiple things over a period of time and that is where uh, you know the concept of 12 projects in 12 months that came into picture so what if i work on multiple projects let's say 6 months or 1 year and that is automated at the end of it and it generates revenue and you move on to new month over a period of time let's say 5 or 6 years you end up creating 5 or 6 projects and these keep generating revenue for you even though you don't work mm-hmm. so essentially what people end up doing their whole lives because it's unoptimized in you know and they don't know it they, they like that's you know uh, you don't have freedom you don't save enough and you, you hardly get leaves so it's so, so many things but the same thing the same time and effort if you take only a fraction of it and put it into different projects of course those have to be successful and that's the risk you take if they are successful then you could you know work for 5 6 years maybe 10 years and easily retire with uh, you know your revenue coming even though you're just relaxing somewhere uh, in a beach yeah so, yeah that that was the real motivation and you know that was my moment okay yes uh, yeah why didn't i think of this before or why didn't i get this advice or why didn't i uh, see this article before and then i said yeah yeah let's do this i think that's the real power of of being an indie maker where you can just create wealth out of basically sweat and tears hard work um it's there's not that many opportunities to do that not in like a leveraged way but if you have a a product that's putting out five thousand dollars a month well that's uh, it's equivalent to like a two hundred fifty thousand dollar portfolio that you just created for yourself. Yeah. Like if you were to compare it to like an index yeah. fund investment or something, it's really yeah. um, very powerful. So, all right. So you've read this Peter Levels article. You've decided to become a wealthy, diversified man by putting your time and effort. No, not wealthy, but <laughs> <laughs> um, so why um, do you quit your job immediately? How does the transition to working on um, Visa List, if that was the first product? How does that happen? Uh, actually, it was not the first product. Um, so after I quit and, you know, so when I was having these thoughts, you know, one of my friends introduced me to Bitcoin and that was in 2017. Mm. And uh, like, I still kick myself. Why didn't I hear about this before? Yeah. Before 2017. Uh, you know, I still hold, uh, I mean, I've, I've never sold anything. So I bought Bitcoins in 2017. I still hold them. I think it reached uh, 17k today. Uh, you yeah, know, you're doing good. <laughs> so what? This, that's this week on Bitcoin. <laughs> but I still kick myself. Away, you know why I didn't mm. knew about this, uh, and maybe uh, two three years before, or mm-hmm. maybe in 2009. <clears throat> so uh, so when I said right, diversify my energy and time. I, I didn't just mean just the projects. I mean, anything, Mm. for example, investing in Bitcoin was also one of the choices Mm -hmm. of, you know, taking time and effort and understand this market and put money and let it grow. So that is also one of the things that I thought. So ultimately, you're trying to generate wealth. It could be uh, based on, uh, uh, you know, own purely time and effort, or it could be based on you know, uh, wealth also, because generally wealth creates wealth. So, <clears throat> and that was the time when I was having these thoughts, mm-hmm. he told me this, and, you know, I start, I, I bought one Bitcoin. Uh, so it's, it's also funny if you, if you've been around that time, have you bought the Bitcoin at, at, at any point of time? Yeah. Um, no? a while ago, I actually got lucky. I bought it 
um, in high school for nefarious reasons, and then it, the price went up later, <laughs> and I was able to sell it <laughs> at a profit. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. So uh, you know, it was crazy times in 2017 where I I was thinking of buying it because it was very new, right? Uh, put that much amount of money on something relatively new, which for me at least. Mm -hmm. So I was contemplating saying, okay, I'll buy it today. Uh, because, you know, it was somewhere around uh, uh, $1,000 or something. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I said, I think it will go down because generally I know stocks right before that. So usually when it, it is having a big bull run, um, it comes down over a period of time. It will course correct, you know, correct, correct itself. So I thought, I think it will go down. Maybe it will go down to uh, eight, $950 or $900. i will buy then. So the next day I see it goes out to eleven hundred dollars. I say, I say, okay, okay. I think in a week it will come down again to maybe thousand. Then I'll buy. Uh, the next week I wait, it goes down to twelve hundred. You know, it it keeps going uh, every week after week, and I'm like, okay, I give up. Uh, I will buy it now. I I don't want to wait. And uh, that was when I first bought. Like when I bought it, uh, I quickly realized right there was ton of cryptocurrencies not just bitcoin and mm -hmm. uh, it was very difficult to manage and i you know uh, i thought why don't i uh, try to manage it myself and i took a week off uh, you know took a leave uh, and built a quick prototype and uh, shared it with my colleagues in the company and they loved it and i thought okay why don't i just put it on play store because i've been an android developer um, i shared it in the company slack group People loved it, uh, you know, and you know it got distraction from that, and you know uh, did some basic ASO similar to SEO for apps, and you know the next thing I know in a month I have ten thousand uh, users, and uh, then you know it, it was fairly successful and in very initially, and because I was also in that period of thinking of quitting, I mean mm -hmm. I I would have eventually quit uh, two or three months later if I had not got the success. Mm -hmm. but I got the success and uh, it was a pure indication that, you know, yes, I've thought about quitting and building things and I've, this is the proof. I've already right. built it and it's successful. So, yeah. yeah How quit. was it uh, monetized yeah, so, enough for you to be able to quit? Uh, okay. So as I said, right, I would have eventually quit either ways. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, the revenue that I got there from the app was primarily through subscriptions. So most mm -hmm. of the app was free. It's a premium model. Uh, but if you want to use advanced options like alerts, one of the things that I did was arbitrage. If you've heard about it, mm -hmm. uh, Bitcoin is in one country, has a different price uh, than in another country. So if you sell it in one country and uh, you know buy, or buy it in one country and sell it, in, you could make profit. It could be, you know, it's a it's borderline. Um, Legally, legal. I mean, it's not exactly that, you know. But yeah, so unregulated. That unregulated, is unregulated. We'll say. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right word. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, that is something uh, that I used a little, and I thought I should add it to the app, and people loved it. So mm -hmm. features like that I kept on adding, and you know, uh, but it was not uh, profitable immediately, and I didn't have a paid plan. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't even have uh, uh, in-app subscription built into it i just had placeholder saying this is a pro for, pro feature you you are getting it for free for now uh, mm. only when it hit a certain threshold um, and and one of the things that i did early on was to have a flag mm -hmm. after i quickly realized after the 10000 users i just i didn't add uh, i mean i didn't make them uh, completely block it and uh, you know said you have to pay and all that I just left it and built the payments into it uh, with a flag saying, when I flip this flag, uh, all the people will see that, you know, you have to pay now for the fee fees, um, pro features, they have been using it for free. So it was three months down the line after I quit my job uh, that I started getting revenue. Uh, but yeah, uh, either ways I would have quit because, you know, that bug of, you know, why spend all my energy, effort, time, you know, in a single place, which I could easily distribute into multiple things. Did that then become enough money to live on or um, was it just kind of a segue into your next ventures? 
Um, actually, it was uh, I was earning uh, at the top. Um, you know, uh, that the peak was four thousand dollars a month uh, for an in, and okay. Uh, before this, uh, uh, I already had projects, side projects. Mm-hmm. Uh, now that I think of it, uh, these were, um, I mean, I, I think I had the indie hacker, indie maker bug in me from very long time. So back in 2009, after I, uh, you know, fresh out of college, I was very passionate and I built a file manager. In Android, there's no file manager. So, and, and yeah, were that, that those were that available, they were very ugly. So I want to make a beautiful, simple mm-hmm. file manager. So I had been running it for, almost uh, seven, eight years till then. So that was also a revenue stream. And on top of it, this was there. So yeah, yeah kind of, uh, yeah, it was, I was, uh, what do you call it? Ram and profitable. Yeah, I, I've become, yeah, that uh, in, I think three months after quitting the job. But yeah, then the market crashed. Uh, if you remember like in 20, uh, 18 January, mm-hmm. I think somewhere on uh, February, Bitcoin. <laughs> so some, yeah. I don't know, it keeps repeating to me, all the projects that I create uh, on the market, the market crashes <laughs> somewhere on February. Stop Same making thing things. <laughs> it's you, it's, it was you all along. <laughs> we finally put the pieces together. We found our man. Yeah. So the market crashes and then I want to understand the transition to, to visa list. How did, how did we get from crypto mm. so, to, um, to visa list? Yeah. So, uh, it's still running. If, uh, you know, uh, a crypto is still there, still generates revenue for me, but not at that scale, uh, because, you know, mm. uh, hopefully the uh, market is picking up. Hopefully, uh, maybe, uh, the days of glory of a crypto will be back. Uh, but yeah. Um, so, uh, this was also a time where, uh, I, I've realized I love traveling, mm-hmm. you know, um, I, I really wanted to, uh, explore the world and, you know, started traveling, and, you know, I had an Indian passport and I was, as I was saying in the beginning, it's not very powerful. You can't go to a lot of places. Mm-hmm. And this is one, I think the tipping point. I wanted to go to Philippines and I searched in Google, you know, visa requirements for Philippines. That's how I search. See, I still search visa requirement for Philippines, not Philippines, visa but requirements. Google understands the other way. Yeah. So I searched and, you know, Google shows this uh, snippets. I think it still shows the snippets out of those pages. I said, you know, visa requirement, no visa, no visa required. Oh, it's great. And I, you know, booked my flights and, you know, hotels, you know, it was two months down the line. I'm like, I'm very excited. And at that point of time, you know, one week before my actual travel, mm-hmm. I was, you know, I, I casually searched in Google again uh, and quickly scrolled, you know, past that, uh, uh, you know, a snippet. Mm-hmm. And I realized uh, that snippet was for Singapore citizens. Oh. And when I scrolled down and I saw for Indians, the visa is actually required. And uh, that was like, okay, what do I do? You know, I, I got panicked and, you know, I went to the embassy. It was closed. It was a holiday in Philippines. Mm. You know, holidays in embassies are dependent on the holidays in that country, not in your country. Mm-hmm. So it's very weird. And, you know, I, I've, I've applied for a different visa uh, in a short period so I could get it quickly so that I don't have to cancel my flight and, you know, uh, a hotel and all that. Ultimately, I didn't get the visa. But during this process, I realized, like, it's all the information that is out there. It's, uh, you know, not uh, the, the actual ones, uh, you know, in the blogs and all. Uh, it was very outdated and you know, I faced so many problems. I just told my one of my friends this, you know, I, this happened. He told me another story of his own, you know, saying, yeah, you know, uh, I went to Vietnam and generally government websites have, you know, .gov in them, right? Mm-hmm. 
But if you search for Vietnamese, you get 10 results. All of them have .gov in it. So which one is the genuine one? Mm. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> so he got duped. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I started finding this pattern that, you know, visa requirements are very problematic, yeah. you know, for a lot of people. And, um, and, and that, at that, that was also a period when I was, uh, trying to move to Australia. So I know a little <laughs> more about visa requirements in general. Mm-hmm. Of course, tourist visa requirements are very lenient compared to these. Uh, skill visas or you know when you move into a different country but I was in that space and I wanted to do something in that and this quickly opened my eyes to a problem that I could simply easily solve and while I was traveling and reminiscing you know how should I build what should I build and somewhere in Twitter I saw somebody building visa list trust me uh, it was visa list mm. but not not IO it was something else, but it was visa list. And I was like, wait, I already have a competition and I have not even started building it. And I, I like, it was like, okay, it's now or never. Right. And ultimately I beat that guy to launch. And I think the project died after uh, visa list went viral, mm. but it was coincidentally called visa list. But something else, visa list dot something else, but not. So yeah, this was very crazy period. It was a so usually what I do is when I'm working on a project, I start looking into what I could build next. Mm-hmm. I don't stop this and then start on the new one, you think and all that. So uh, simultaneously I keep working on what I'm working on and think about what I should do in the future. Mm-hmm. Future, you know. Uh, talk to people, uh, you know, based on personal problems, see how that resonates with them. Uh, all the while working on, uh, at, the, at that point of time, I was working on a crypto. And uh, I think after the market crashed, uh, I slowly transitioned, uh, you know, started working on this and collecting data because mm-hmm. I knew um, I couldn't launch uh, without data or, you know, the basic ones. And, you know, there are like a lot of websites which just show that or you know whether a visa is required or not that's it Mm -hmm. you didn't have the detailed uh, checklist put uh, exactly what type of uh, document you need what different things you need Uh, are there any special things that you need to take care of you know uh, are there any visa exemptions of course over a period of time it became and if you go to visa list now you will have uh, so many tons of features but yeah it was just very plain and simple uh, but that required data and it took me a while to collect that data. How do you keep all that data updated on an ongoing basis? Are you still doing it by hand? Have you hired people yeah. to help you? Um, no, uh, I've stopped it now. Uh, main reason is because of COVID. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, all those, uh, these are, I mean, even if I collect that. So uh, one of my uh, thumb rule to anything, the approach is, do something which immediately benefits you, mm-hmm. you know, uh, in terms of uh, whatever you build, in terms of anything. Uh, so if, let's say if I keep updating, adding more revisa requirements, but because the whole world is in a standstill, nobody's mm-hmm. going to use it. So I, I'm not doing that. If, if, it, if there was no COVID, I would be still doing it. I think I have more than 100 countries visa requirements uh, all of them for those 100 countries to all the countries still have those the other 100 plus countries but these are relatively less mm. uh, traveled ones mm-hmm. comparatively uh, so how do you yeah, know it's, if, it's just if that. something has changed do you have like systems that notify you or you just go, went through and checked every now and then uh, so one of the things that i do is uh, um, i have collected the actual sources so, you know, the actual government websites. Mm-hmm. So what I do is I keep uh, uh, seeing the basic requirements if it has changed. So here's the uh, base logic. When, when I told you in the beginning, right, these are these different combinations. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a huge amount of data. But if you think about it, there are only four types of visas for any country in terms of tourists. Mm-hmm. Either it is visa free to all the countries, like you have 250 countries, 
all these countries would either fall into one of these categories mm-hmm. either it's visa free or it's visa on arrival or it is e visa or it is an actual uh, you know visa which you have to go to the embassy to get it mm-hmm. so for any country there are only four types and these visa visa categories don't change the countries that fall into these categories could shift from one uh, you know category to other category and uh, most of these visa requirements that i have collected have been almost consistent uh, i do I actually do an audit every now and then but mm-hmm. that's on a, a whole uh, you know uh, my idea was once i complete all of them because i have these actual websites i could monitor these websites for changes but yeah that's still in a because of covid i, I couldn't implement a lot of these things but hopefully I, that must that's also my plan and it's just all this traffic is from one visa category mm-hmm. imagine what would happen if i build for student visas for business visas this could be there are basically 12, 20 different types of visas and that's my potential um, potential of visa list and that i have not even explored so yeah my plan is to do that at that point you'll definitely need those automated systems checking for diffs and things it becomes yeah. just impossible it already One of sounds the things impossible that I, to keep up up to date without some automation yeah eventually. yeah so definitely i have uh, partly it is automated mm-hmm. um the reason why i didn't go into those was i want to build the perfect recipe for tourist visas first mm-hmm. once i have figured this then i just could hire you know a bunch of people and just tell them what to do because the recipe is ready they just mm-hmm. have to replicate it so yeah let's go on to um your new project newish i guess simple ops can you um, just tell us what Simple Ops is, and then maybe we can talk about how that got started as well. Yes. So um, Simple Ops, it's okay. So Simple Ops is basically uh, your anybody who has a business, uh, online business, uh, they can use this to monitor their website performance, health. And if there is any downtime at any point of time, they'll get notified. So mm-hmm. yeah, simple operations, simple DevOps for everybody. Mm-hmm. So that's why simple ops. Yeah. <clears throat> there is a lot of competition to simple ops, um, but there is hardly any for performance monitoring. So a lot of people confuse simple ops with uh, just perform, sorry, uptime monitoring. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of uh, competition for uptime monitoring, but when it comes to performance monitoring, a lot of these just do only uptime monitoring. They don't do performance monitoring. But my so approach was by, to actually start by performance, with performance monitoring, monitoring. We mean like time to load for the page, or what's the uh, measure of performance? So Google Lighthouse is uh, it has all these different uh, metrics that it calculates. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I take all those things and keep a history of it. So what happens is typically, if you're a developer or you know, or a, a person who manages a website, you check these performance time to time, but you don't know what happened last time and you could have made a lot of changes. You, you don't know how much it has improved. You can't keep a track of them. So simple ops helps you to manage that. So you don't have to worry about manually calculating these scores uh you know checking the performance over a period of time i think there is more more than 20 different uh, metrics mm-hmm. in those performance uh, that could be measured and tracked this is something you built to monitor visualist originally is that where the idea came from yes yes because um, visualist has more than 150k pages and mm-hmm. every now and then because of the huge amount of traffic more than 450k users every month uh i i it was very, becoming very difficult to manage the performance and you know improve them mm-hmm. and track them whether it has improved or not. Uh, it, and I've looked for solutions and uh, almost all of them were corporate ones and they were like it was breaking my bank, you know. Mm-hmm. So I thought, you know, why does it have to be that costly? 
Mm-hmm. And then I looked into it and I realized it doesn't have to be at all paid. It could be free. And that's when I started uh, Simple Ops. And that was my plan to have at least 10,000 users, free users using Simple Ops. So Simple Ops, by default, if you you know go to Simple Ops and just sign up, you don't you don't have to give any credit card any any of that just give, you know put put your website the url there and that's it you're up and running uh, but yeah uh, if you want more uh, uh, then just one monitor if you want to manage multiple monitors and if you want to do api monitoring or if you want to check if your server is up or down uh, for that there are paid plans but by default simple ops is free if you actually see all my products are freemium or free because i don't mm-hmm. believe that uh, uh, you know exclusively paid there is nothing like exclusively paid uh, uh, code you know code is code you know it, I, I believe in open source and uh, and explorer one of my uh, early apps it's still open source uh, like i have thousands of clones of an explorer which are doing much more than an explorer mm-hmm. But I, I don't mind that. I mean, I take that as a compliment. I, you know, revenue is you know not the most important thing. So I build all these under an umbrella called DWorks, mm-hmm. um, and the mot- m- motto of it is to m- m- make a small difference in the world, like tiny difference. That's you know he- that is to help by helping others. Visa list is to help. You know, yes, it does. I does try to make revenue out of it, mm-hmm. but most of it is free. Like but if any, you weren't taking any pay. revenue from it, then you wouldn't be able to afford to work on it in the first place. That's true. I mean, I ultimately, I have to shut it down, right? Because mm-hmm. I, I can't sustain it for a long period without zero, with zero revenue, I can't sustain. But yeah. What was the launch of Simple Ops like? How similar was it to VisaList? And your strategy there? <laughs> it, it was completely different. Um, so the the thing with the visa list was uh, anybody could use it. Like mm-hmm. almost everybody travels, right? So it's useful for anyone. Even if you want, even if uh, you have a powerful passport, still you need to understand few things that you need to carry when you're actually going on a visa-free visit. There are still certain things that uh, you need to know, uh, restrictions, limitations. Um, so, you know, it was uh, generally um, anybody could use it. So I launched anywhere. Uh, if it's something interesting, people would uh, uh, look at it. But this was B2B. Mm-hmm. So it is dedicated to a certain section of people, a very niche set of people, uh, especially uh, people who are building online businesses. Uh, so, and I, so I had this thumb rule of any project that I build, I try to build it in less than a month and launch it quickly because I want to fail fast. And if I fail fast, I know if I have to continue this or improve it or quit Mm -hmm. that way I can move on to the next project. Uh, But with simple ops i had to take a different approach because uh, it 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 might i don't know uh, but uh, it it might look simple the name is simple but it's very complicated to build that infrastructure uh, the servers how you uh, you know pull these different websites track these uh, metrics keep them and show them you know so it's it's a a very complicated architecture. And yeah. uh, before I actually put it out to the world, I wanted to make sure, you know, a double check every single thing. And so I was ready with uh, the project in a month. It took me, I think, 40 days, but I, I didn't launch it. I did a soft launch and put it in beta and I, you know, fix tons of bucks in that next one month. Mm-hmm. And then I finally launched it. So that was, you know, I think the first project which I, or at least after I became an indie maker, this was the first mm-hmm. project which took more than 
a month to release. Actually, it took me two months to release. I mean, how did one you find your planning. beta users? Okay, so <clears throat> I just uh, used my Twitter. So uh, I just uh, told uh, this is something I'm working on. Um, I used uh, I, I I know a few people on Twitter. Uh, um, so I've sent them uh, DM saying so why don't you give this a try? Um, you know you might <clears throat> uh, you know you might not have heard about performance monitoring, but trust me, this is important and stuff like that. So yeah, I, I generally got a very good response. I mean, I think uh, after I did a soft launch, so basically announcing on Twitter that this is, you, know, you could try it for free. I think uh, in a week I got 100 users. And I think that was a good ind indication and motivation for me to, you know, keep working on it, you know, without breaks. So yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it, so from the planning to actual release, it took me three months. One month just thinking of the architecture. Yeah, it was that complicated. And then when it came to the official launch, she was back to product hunt? No. So, <laughs> instead of, okay, so what I did was instead of launching on product hunt, I posted it on Hacker News mm. and it went viral there. And I, so, okay. So I have this uh, indie makers community in Australia. Mm -hmm. It's a group that I run. Um, so, uh, so we have a telegram group. So, and we have these monthly meetups. So in that I was just trying to pitch a different thing. It just occurred to me uh, because nobody does this. Um, so it's a B2B product and it's not like you could scale for thousands of users, you have to increase your infrastructure, right? Right. Not. I w and and I've been reading stories about B two B products. It takes them years to get ten users. Of course, it picks up after that, but it takes a lot of time for people to build that. You know, mm -hmm. customers. And because mine is not, I mean, it's not the typical B two B product in terms of pricing. All of them are free trials and then you have to pay or you don't use it. <clears throat> Mine is freemium, so you don't have to pay at all. I thought, and I pitched this idea. I thought, why don't I give a lifetime deal like for a limited period so that I get more users who are serious mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I get direction and at, at the same time I have a uh, cash flow so I could even if I don't get actual monthly subscribers for uh, maybe a year, I think I could easily manage uh, running the servers without that. And that give, these people will give me, uh, you know, the, the direction, uh, the roadmap for the product, because till then I built what I thought was I required for Weaselist. But, you know, Weaselist, I mean, you, you can't build a product for one, one particular customer. You have to build it for generic set of customers so that, you know, it's uh, everybody falls into that, uh, you know, feature set and everybody's happy. And I pitched this idea. So few were skeptical and few said, uh, yeah, just give it a try. Uh, I think it, it could work, work great. And How much did you that's charge what I did. For, for lifetime access round one? 199. 199. And for that, they can use it for yeah. as long as the product exists. Yes, and I, but like I was, I mean, uh, <laughs> people started getting. So I launched it at, um, I think, uh, midnight, and in the morning when I woke up, it was I think on a Sunday, if I remember. Mm -hmm. I was going to play volleyball, and like uh, my phone keep kept ringing because I have this. Um, um, uh, push notifications mm -hmm. to my Telegram chat bot from Stripe. So whenever there's a payment, I get notified and like, okay, 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 I keep getting these notifications that somebody paid 199, 199, 199, 199. And um, yeah, that was uh, yeah, a good, good indication that people saw value. Partly, I think uh, it also created a FOMO. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's cheap lifetime deal. Mm -hmm. Yes, this, 
but of course you never if you think i i would never use it you wouldn't buy it right even if right. it's cheap so it was a very good mix of pricing model or launch strategy was you know launching on mm-hmm. uh, hacker news you know? so how many people ended Weird up signing up that first day for uh, uh, for the lifetime deal more or less mm, more or less um, 30 some somewhere around 30 people 30 so off the bat, yeah. that's like six thousand dollars to to keep working on this project and some really good yeah. validation. So um, okay, so what I did is because people were buying uh, LTDs left and right, mm-hmm. I panicked and increased the pricing uh, because you know I wanted it to. I don't want everybody to buy. I like I can't sustain if I sell thousand LTDs, right? Right. So I wanted it to be limited. So I just immediately switched to two ninety nine and then to three ninety nine. So I ended up making. Up. Sorry. No, you go ahead. Yeah. So um, I made uh, over ten k uh, in the launch. Uh, it's pretty much I one think, day. Yeah. Ten thousand dollars. For two two days, I think. Two yeah. days. Like. It's well, a 24 that, hour cycle, more or is less. Is that yeah. the best two day period you've ever done in terms of revenue? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I think the end? most successful launch. It's a pretty good couple of, of days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like I spent three months. Imagine if you're working on something for three months. Yeah. Because it's a paid product, you know, and suddenly you get this. And yeah, yeah it's, it's just, yeah, amazing. It was amazing. Overnight success to that only that. took uh, three months to build before that first, yeah, before the night. Yeah. Literally overnight, in yeah. the sense that you posted on midnight and woke up to your phone buzzing. Yes. Um, yeah. Af- so after the launch, did you take the same strategy as VisaList in terms of SEO, or did you have new strategies that you needed to apply to this new company? Hmm. So I don't call them companies. I call them micro startups. I don't even call them startups. So yeah, they are small scale, and they are one mm-hmm. one person. So. Yeah, I think it got stuck. A lot of people started using it, uh, micro startups. But yeah, so uh, I, I okay. So the thing with uh, B two B is uh, I'm still learning. So it's just been mm. three months since the launch. Um, so uh, only after a certain period I could go and say, ah, oh, this worked and this didn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, but right now I've done SEO. I didn't do the traditional SEO because there is no content, right? Mm. You might think, okay, how can I do SEO? Yeah, the basic website, then the pricing page, about page. But no, I thought about something. I mean, I, for me, I you know, whenever I build something, I, I think it's great. But ultimately, whether it works out and just helps the cause or not, that's a different thing. But I think um, uh, what I did with SEO here is in itself unique in, in this space, maybe. So what I did is I took top 2000 websites in the world and started monitoring them mm-hmm. and have pages for them and based on categories. So if you see there is something called at the bottom. So it's not, uh, it's in the footer, there's something called top websites. If you go there, then you could see a uh, list of top websites and you could so, you know filter them by you know c- categories uh, and then if you go into individual ones you could see details uh, of those performance and all that sorry uh, so this is something uh, i thought is a very good strategy whether it will work out or not i'm not sure mm-hmm. but uh, yeah because seo as i said right new website takes time right. to even kick start you know showing these things getting listed it takes a lot of time so, so but i think, to um, tell still yeah too too early too early um so that was one of the strategies that i started working on but there is something else that i did uh one of the things that i noticed was there are a lot of uh, integrations that are possible in different uh, platforms nobody really thinks about those things for example um, Slack is a marketplace. Mm-hmm. You could put your app in Slack and all the Slack users, your app has a visibility to all those users. Similarly to GitHub, 
you know that's a it has a marketplace and it's perfect for you know something like simple ops you know yeah. because it's related to their you know repository if they have a website you know it could monitor that uh, so that is the strategy that i'm currently working on which is basically rather than me going to people i uh, i want to put simple ops in places where people go mm -hmm. by themselves so these are the marketplaces so rather than me pushing them okay do you need this do you need this do you need this i'm just saying okay where do people hang out yeah these are the marketplaces where uh, you know developers hang out github slack you know all the not just developers so uh, now it's not just developers so it's it's a wider broader audience so it simple ops does uh, website monitoring api monitoring and server monitoring uh, of course there's the initial plan but i have plans if it is successful i have plans to go in different directions so basically the idea is to make devops simple for everyone that's why simple ops uh, but for now i want to concentrate on these core areas and uh, for example google chat so uh, so you could have alerts into google chat so uh, that's also something that i built uh, which i believe uh, none of the competition competition has those many integrations mm -hmm. i'm not talking about the corporate ones uh, they, who they charge those, those that charge you, you know, 200 300 dollars per month I'm saying uh, uh, you know <clears throat> for a small scale monitoring solution uh, they don't have these many, uh, and I think that is also one of the strong points for simple ops. Mm -hmm. So any any of the alerting system, sorry, uh, channels that you think of, most of the channels that people use, this is available. For example, Facebook Messenger. So simple ops can alert you on a Facebook Messenger as well. Unfortunately, Facebook has. Uh, shut down their marketplace for uh, Facebook bots. So you lose that on the distribution for that. Which yeah. It's kind of a nice to have, but it doesn't actually win you any new customers. Given that the like yeah. SEO thing and the integrations are still fairly new, how are you currently winning customers? How are they finding you? So uh, through these or channels. how are you finding them? So, so these are already so, uh, bringing in, in customers. Yeah. Uh, not in uh, big volumes but um, you know few few uh, customers a month so these are the people who actually convert and these are the people who found simple ops through these channels for example somebody found me through uh, google chat there are bots uh, in google chat and the simple ops is a bot there mm. um, and people hardly know about google chat bots you know it's it's, it's a relatively new market there and being new to that market is what helps me because uh, over a period of time others will come but because i've yeah. come earlier i would have more influencer more uh, you know ranking higher ranking and all of that so it's it's a long term game uh, b2b is definitely a long term game i have few more plans um, uh, in terms of uh, how to gain, get more customers but i don't want to tell that right now because i'm not even sure how Fair that enough. will pan out yeah, um, yeah. It looks so, seems like yeah, definitely once already, it works out, I would definitely tell that. It seems like these are already paying dividends. So if you're reporting your revenue on indie hackers is already over seven thousand dollars a month, if that number's accurate, mm -hmm. then it seems like this these efforts have already at least paid off in the short term to win you that many customers. Yes, yes. It's still still uh, not in in it, it, these have not realized their full potential. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. Paying but off, I, but I'm still have a lot of room open. to grow. Yeah, three months. Yeah, so very less time. Yeah. All right. So maybe a couple questions to to wrap us up here. Um, for the the new indie maker, the new indie hacker, what is what is your advice to someone just starting out today? Mm. Okay. A lot of people have asked me. Uh, a lot of new people have actually asked me, "What should I do? How should I do?" Mm -hmm. I always tell them pick something that you know you personally faced a problem with because 
one of the things that you could easily cut down is customer research. If you become your own customer, you are you know, saving a lot of time mm. in those cycles, trying to understand. And generally, because you have that problem, you are more passionate about it. And uh, the probability is very high of you becoming successful in that regard. And this happened to me. All the projects that I've done, which are successful, uh, are the ones which I personally face a problem with. And few have, of them have done, mm -hmm. which I didn't face the problem personally. I don't think I've told people what they were, but they didn't work out. So historically over, let's say my six, seven years or eight years of these things that I've been building, uh, I've seen, you know, uh, this pattern, at least it's true with me. And yeah, I think, um, I, I guess, I believe that it should be generally true, uh, you know, for most of the people. I'm not saying don't work on other problems that you see, but I'm just saying the probability is much higher. It seems to hold true that a lot of the, the indie makers we see succeed, build something for themselves first and then figured out how to monetize it. Yeah, yeah. Definitely not a, uh, a the rule, second, there's exceptions, but um, a pattern. Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah, definitely a pattern. Uh, so the, the second thing um, that I've observed is, um, once you start building something, people give up very, fairly, very quickly. Mm. They work on it for a month, two months, they launch it and nothing happens. And there's this, oh no, you know, that guy, they did an amazing launch and, you know, he's generating that much revenue in first month. And this guy is, you know, getting thousands of users and, you know, I have hardly any users. Uh, so I think, uh, you, Yes, definitely. If you've not achieved, achieved some success, uh, that's that's a bad sign. But that also means that uh, you have uh, clearly missed something uh, very important. So that doesn't mean you have to quit it. Okay, so here's the strategy that I usually follow. And I think if you follow this strategy, uh, you could be fairly successful. It's, it's not that, you know, this... Uh, path to success. It's a template that I follow. Uh, so if things work out, you keep working on it. If things don't work out, you move on to the next one. Mm. So what I do is I have an idea. I try to validate it with a few of my friends, which do an elevator. I usually do an elevator pitch. I do this when I'm actually working on something currently. So it's not like I stop something and then, you know, start working on a new idea. So these, these work parallelly. And, and I also, uh, you know, when I'm pitching, I improve it. So the first person from that feedback that I get, I improve it. And you know, it's, it's just, a, you know, 30 second pitch that I do. And if people are convinced and at least 50 people of them thought, yeah, it's a great idea. Then I start thinking about what should be the MVP and all. Mm -hmm. And my very hard thumb rule on this is finish it in less than a month. The basic break it down to the basic core problem, build end-to-end -end product, which is the MVP and just launch it. And it's very, very important in my opinion is you have to be objective. Before you start working, before you have even written a single line of code, you set a metric, you know, goal thing. For example, for VisaList, my goal was to get 5,000 users mm. in a month. I'm not saying that that's, that was a great goal. I'm saying at that point of time, you know the reality. When mm. you don't have anything, you know. So I just calculated, okay, there are 200K users uh, who usually search, I guess, uh, it's very way off the actual numbers, but I thought, okay, maybe 10% or 5% of that uh, is what I want. Um, if I could capture, that means there is traction, then if I get traction, then I could keep working on it. I'm glad that I was way off, you know, that the target was way off. But the point is you have to have a target even before you start anything. And once you start working on it, at the end of it, if it's close to that target, that means there is traction. So that number could be anything. 
for me it was 5000 users for visa list it could be uh, 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 you know a thousand dollars or it could be ten dollars or it could be hundred dollars it could be anything uh, it could be revenue it could be users any anything that you deem that there is traction set that goal that is very important and at the end of it if you don't get traction that means you are not close to the goal mm. stop working on the project and move on it's very very important a lot of people uh, are very passionate you know when they, they, they are very emotional about it and here is the problem with being emotional emotion doesn't really help you make anything successful mm. so sometimes you have to be objective yes if you have passion yeah you could uh, take things to the finish line but if you are in the wrong direction no matter how far you take you're not going to win the race you know, if you're in the opposite direction yeah. so, so these are very two i mean two important things that i follow uh, and i think these are very important for somebody who's starting uh, in my opinion yeah beautiful harry um thank you so much for for coming on um this was great i feel like i learned so much and i think that everybody listening to this later going to take a lot out of it. There was so much um, just actionable advice and experience that you have brought to the table here. Um, so really, thank you. Uh, I'm glad uh, having this conversation, Anthony. Uh, hopefully people will uh, find this useful uh, as you did. I think that I'm sure they will. I have no doubts in my mind that this is going to be quite popular. Um, yeah, thank, thank awesome. you again for coming. And uh, I hope we can keep in touch. Looking forward to the growth Definitely. of Simple Ops into um, yet another piece of your your indie maker empire that you that you've been building. <laughs> <laughs> Big word empire, but yeah, <laughs> a micro empire. Thanks, thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's that's actually very apt. Yeah, micro empire. Yeah, <laughs> thanks a lot, Anthony. Yeah, it was fun um, talking to you. Likewise, have a good one.